This was kicked off last year after a conversation at the Gastein conference about patient data and databases about the impact of opt-in, opt-out, and if some of the patient-led models would actually be a viable option. And so we decided, well, let's take a look and find out. And so we ran a research project to do so. The researchers were myself and Dr. Daniel Gassel primarily. We also ran the methodology with Mark Trusheim. I met with him in Boston. We discussed the early versions of the research. And we've obviously had the input of Wendy, as well as all the members of the steering committee who were participants from these organizations who helped run and fund the, organ run the project. So that's Pfizer, Janssen, Oracle, FPA. Health Policy and Technology, IBM, and ABPI, and I'd like to thank them for their support, as well as these research partners who provided data and data support to the research project. Now, um, <clears throat> I'm going to begin with a disclaimer. Uh, <laughs> the theoretical time impact of databases and identification, we've done an actual ROI on this, but um, we've based this on, we've done probably 20, 30 interviews with a lot of researchers who run clinical trials. And so we've based these assessments on a general opinion about what these databases could do. And we think that's a pretty good assessment. We think what they can do is, is really interesting. Now, we don't know that until we try it, and we are in discussions about trying it. But we've made some sensitivity analysis about what these could do. But we're basing these. These are all a little bit of that, but it's based on experience and what we think the data can do, and it's based on the data we've got now. Um, we assume that the patient databases, particularly the ones in Europe, like the CPRD, are unaffected by the 2014 March ruling of the European Parliament. In fact, that may not be the case, but we're making an assumption that good sense will prevail in the Council. Um, the ROI and cost assumptions are based on industry cost averages, so please, these are not specific costs. These are average costs to value time. So please, if there's any payers in here, do not make an assessment about a drug or for reimbursement based on this model. And we assume that there are many more searchable databases than there are. There actually right now aren't that many. Um, and I think we've spoken to just about all of them in the course of doing this research. Um, so we make some assumptions about if there were X number of databases. And that, that's based on the research we've done with the databases we've worked with, okay? So here's the problem. Again, I don't think this is any mystery. In the areas of major unmet medical need, you know, cardiovascular disease, oncology, you know, basically, you know, Alzheimer's disease, you know, we're looking at disease, you know, success rates of launches for new medicines of about one success for every 20 failures, one success for every 22 failures. So it's really tough, and these, these numbers are not getting any better. Here's the current pathway. Now, you've probably seen a similar chart to this for the pathway that's currently used in general. Uh, we've adopted this one for Europe because in Europe we have another process where we then, once we have EMA approval, go into negotiations at the member state level for reimbursement. And, for example, Tygenix a couple years ago took four years to get reimbursement in Spain. So it is taking an extra two to five years in some cases in Europe, which adds enormous costs. And unfortunately, patients do not get new medicines until there. So in Europe we have an extra level of difficulty that we're dealing with. So. What we wanted to do was look at the impact and the potential impact of real-world evidence on that, on those numbers, and then see how it can relate to MAPS. Right now, recruitment time takes up roughly a third of all clinical trial time. So just actually identifying and recruiting patients is taking about a third of the time. And you can see that in the areas of unmet medical needs, so all the central nervous systems, oncology, and cardiovascular disease, the average is about eight years to submission, and these are taking nine to 10 years. So these areas are also very difficult and taking longer than the average. So what we decided to do is we took three clinical trial studies from clinicaltrials.gov, and we built an exclusion and inclusion criteria directly from those trials, and we decided to test them in a few databases, ones that are actually running, to see what we would get. And we ran them in three, we ran studies in three different databases. Two of them are national style databases. So one is the CPRD, the Trial Viz platform, Tim Williams. And then we also worked with the University of Pennsylvania through the Oracle Health Sciences Network. And you can see that one of these, you know, CPRD is about 4.6 million GPs, general practitioner data, whereas Penn Medicine, Oracle, is about 2.25, and that's hospital data. And that becomes really interesting when we get into the work because they do respond differently. And then we also worked with the patients in Patients Know Best. We did a survey of about 600 of their patients with two practitioners. And again, really fascinating data. So first query we ran, and this is an illustrated output of the CPRD database. We ran an Alzheimer's query, and we liked this one because it was short. And it also had an assisted living requirement, which means you need to be able to link insurance data. 
So we ran this, and you can see here, this distribution here shows where the practitioners are and how many potential patients are in each spot. This is what we get out of the CPRD. We can't go any lower than this because this is anonymized patient data. So you can see one location with 54, one location with 48, two locations with 42 patients, and it even gives you a geographic distribution. Really interesting. And you can see that the output was 1,353 patients for this query. So we also ran that query in Penn Medicine's database with the Oracle Science Network. And you can see they got 890. So that's roughly three per 10,000 disease prevalence, give or take. A little bit more in uh, UPenn, a little bit less, but right around three per 10,000. So they're we're in the ballpark of each other. And what this implies, Alzheimer's, according to peer review literature, generally has a 60% acceptance rate to join a clinical trial under the current recruitment process, which means you set up an agreement with a bunch of hospitals, you wait for them to come through the door for about a year, and then a certain percentage of them who come through the door in your catchment area will agree to participate. And so we assume those historical averages will be the same, about 60%. So 60% of 1,300, 670, 60% of 890, 445. Now this trial required 249, locate, uh, 249 actual patients, so you can see we actually targeted more, and this took not a year, it took one afternoon, about an hour, to run. And what this implies is the locations, UPenn could do everything in one location, CPRD could do everything in about five locations, again, looking at this distribution curve. And the trial actually required 53 locations. So this implies that you could actually cut your locations radically by using these databases in such a function. Okay, nice example. Now let's go to cardiovascular disease. Obviously this is GP data, nationwide data, 136,000 for this slightly more complex query based on LDL ratios along with some biomarker information. And again, nice concentrations here. One, one clinician, we assume that's at a teaching hospital of some type, 1,000 patients, two at 960, seven at 800. And again, we get a nice geographic distribution. So if we wanted to or if we're gonna test this going forward, we can find where we need to go. We can't touch them, but then we can hopefully develop processes to identify them. Now we tested this against Penn Medicine 136,000 against 982. 10% acceptance rate for cardiovascular, much lower than Alzheimer's. 13,098. Interestingly enough, this implies seven locations. Why? Because, again, this distribution at 10%, you require seven different locations. And then we would need, and this is an assumption, we would need to find seven universities like Penn Medicine with 2.25 million patients given their distribution. Now, I'm sure all of you are looking at this saying, wow, that is a big, <laughs> that's a big difference, you know, why? And I agree with you, and I will get into that. Again, the location's much bigger of a cut, but really, why is there a difference of an or several orders of magnitude? And this becomes really interesting. And Daniel, my partner, and I, we really struggled with this for about a week, and then we realized they must be different populations. They just have to be, and they are. And I know I, Hans Georg this morning, mentioned that we really need hospital data. We really need the hospital data to get these tertiary locations. I say you need the hospital data and you need the GP data, particularly for cardiovascular disease, because, for example, look at this LDL ratio exclusion. Look at this, 90, 97%, a little less than 96.5% are excluded here, 75. Huge differences. Basically, a lot of these people fall out of the LDL ratio. Renal failure or stroke, look at this. Why is that? It's because when you're going to a hospital for cardiovascular disease, you're in a very severe state. You're in a much more severe state than the general population. So, I mean, how many people with high blood pressure go to the hospital every year? Very few. So in fact, you're only going to the hospital if you're, you have a problem. So we can't assume these populations are the same. They're not. That's why they're demonstrably different. So you can't just rely on one database. You'd actually need to work with both and combine them. Now, cancer. We looked at an oncology trial. And you can see that you know, CPRD was not able to link to the biomed and the staging data and a lot of the biomarkers, so they were unable to run the query. Penn Medicine gave us an output of 262. Oncology, huge variance, but in general, we used the meta-analysis and determined that it would be about a 45% capture area. The lower end, we've seen 75. We put it at 45. That's where we saw a mode of answers, so we assumed that would be correct. So that gives us 118. Now, this trial required 1,713 patients and this implies 15 locations like Penn, an enormous reduction of the 134 that were actually required to run the trial. So, 
Huge implications are for research, what about the patient managed databases? What about these ones where the patients themselves are engaged? We ran a survey with uh, 540 patients and patients know best. They're a startup they've been going for a couple years up in Cambridge and Oxford, have a nice venture capital fund uh, getting them going, growing, very interesting population. And of the 540 patients that were submitted to survey, 161 responded. That gives us a 95% confidence interval with a margin of error of 5% because the ratios were 80-20. So again, nice tight statistical variance there. We're happy with this data. Now, this is a question we've asked, seen many surveys, people ask, would you share your data, et cetera. What we've not seen is, do you or a member of your family have a chronic condition for which there's no cure? So we're trying to test and see what percentage of the people who are involved in patients know best are there and motivated because they're dealing with a chronic illness. And you can see it's well over 80%. Now this is the data we've seen on several surveys, all of us here, I'm sure. Would you be willing to share your medical records? About 92% said yes. Now again, the final one and probably the most important one for the purposes of today, would you be willing to participate as a research subject yourself? Now what's interesting here is 73% said yes. Now these are really high numbers and more than we would have expected. These are people who are very motivated to try and find a cure. So what does this imply given the other research we looked at? Well. Let's go back to that Alzheimer's query, and this is the actual query out of the CPRD database. So we're starting with 4.6 million. The first question we asked to get to have that was, are you a male or female over 50? So that cuts it roughly by half, a little more than half. And then we asked, you know, the next query uh, point was, are you at risk of Alzheimer's? So that's the second inclusion. Now that gets us to 14,872 off uh, 4.6 million. Now if you look at the ratios with a 60% acceptance rate off the total patients is 670. Now what this implies with the, uh, with the trial that required 249 is in fact, you could run this whole trial with a motivated group of patients in Alzheimer's disease with about 4,000. So you don't need 4.6, you could theoretically establish a relationship, have a robust set of data and do it with only 4,000 patients. Your statistics would be exactly the same. So potentially these patient-led databases can be radically more efficient potentially. Again, we don't know until we test it for real. But this implies these have a huge optimization scenario potential. So what does all this mean on time for patients? Because all this is about bringing new medicines to patients faster. Well, again, this gets us into the normal recruitment time. Again, if we look at the normal process, it's, you wait for them to come through the door, it takes about a year, and then Again, talking to dozens of clinical trial managers, there's generally about a three-month process after someone agrees, you do the, you know, the informed consent, you do secondary testing, et cetera, to identify, okay? So what we did is we said, okay, X months we can reduce, and then we're gonna leave this three months as a constant. So reducing everything down to three months is considered 100% in this case. That would be a 100% reduction. Now again, that's the optimal scenario. That's the goal. Now, do we think we can do that? Well, we'd like to hope so, and matter of fact, several people we spoke to said you could probably even do it faster, but we're gonna stick with that. And then we did some sensitivity analysis and said, okay, 25, 50, and 100%, what is this impact? Well, here you go, here's cardiovascular disease, here's the current scenario, phase one, phase two, phase three, 8.2 years. A 25% reduction, 7.8 years. A 50% reduction, 7.3 years. And if we can get it down to that three months, 6.4 years. Again, here's oncology, cancer, currently 7.4 years, 6.9 years, 25%, 50% reduction, 6.6, 100% reduction, 5.6. And again, in Alzheimer's disease, similar story, currently 7.2 years. If we can reduce that using the databases, it gets us down to 6.7 years, a 50% reduction, so roughly four and a half months, not nine months, 6.4, and then a 100% reduction just down to that three month signing period, 5.4 years. So. How do we value that? What does that mean from time? Now this gets into the some of the investment calculations that actually correlates very well with what Mark was discussing today. And again, just for those of us in the room who are not familiar, if you make an investment at $10 million at time zero, and it's, you wait seven years, you would expect a return on investment of about $20 million, give or take. It's actually a little, it's like 7.18 years, but give or take, it's like an extra month, but roughly doubles every seven years. Now, if you do this in five years, you expect a return of 16 million because that's two years less. Now to the investor, these are the same. It doesn't matter. I mean, you're getting your return of investment, but there's a cost savings and cost of capital overall of four million. 
And that's a really important point. That's four million of cash flow that can do other things, okay? So that's why time, you can value time as a relative form of investment. If you look at these, are investments decisions that are being made. You save time, you save this cost of capital. Now, one thing we also need to consider are the failure rates because if taking back the 16 million in five years, if the project has a one in two chance of success or one in two chance of failing, you would then double the risk because you're cutting that value in half. So it's no longer 16 million, it's 32 million because that's your expected rate of return given the failure rate. And this becomes very important to the industry because they fail a lot right now. So we took the average cost. This is an update of the Damasi number that was published by Paul in 2010. This actually lined up very well with the R&D expenditure of new molecular entities from the budgets published in Bloomberg as well as uh, some studies from um, MRS, CMR, et cetera. So this seemed to be a more accurate number. These are the fa by-phase failure rates. Uh, excuse me, these are the by-phase success rates, so a 95% failure rate in central nervous system medicines that go into phase one, 9% su you know, um, success rate, 33% in phase. So what this means, by the time you get the 11% cost of capital, on this investment. These are what the numbers turn into because you're annuitizing failure. I should also say that uh, cancer, obviously cancer is impacted here by slightly higher success rates because of things like conditional approval and also this is an average cancer drugs generally cost a lot more. So this is relative speaking here, okay? So, but relatively, this is what the time value does to these drugs. So what happens then comparing these reductions in time to the time value of money? Well. The current cost, again, looking at cardiovascular disease is one billion. If you get a 100% reduction, cutting out just in the cost of capital, this is just working capital requirements and time. If you can get it down to that three months, you're potentially saving 130 million, just in cost of capital. Same with cancer drugs. Current is 80, 895 million. The reduction of getting it down to three months is 105 million in cost of capital. And again, in Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's been brutally <laughs> attacked by failure rates, just a terrible, terrible drug to be working in. Uh, currently, it's 2.3 billion, and you see here with a reduction of 100%, just getting it down to the three months, there's a $300 million. <laughs> so this is the actual time saved scale over the savings, so you can see how these things go up. Phase one, obviously, the longer, more time you save, the more this ratio goes up because phase one is earlier in the process and you're carrying that cost of capital longer. So time has a greater impact on phase one. And this is the sensitivity analysis. Again, we gave a 50% variation just to check and see how sensitive these things are. And you can see without question, startup time, identification time, and weighted average cost of capital weigh far more than the cost. So really, it is a question of time. Fail faster, fail cheaper. That's what this says. So how does this relate to medicine's adaptive pathways? What does all this mean? Everything I've shown you is in the traditional pathway. How does MAPS work? In MAPS, we start with a, the theory at least, is we will start with a core targeted population based on biomarker information that we can identify, and then based on evidence, we'll slowly move that out. It's possible and highly conceivable that these type of databases, these real-world evidence databases, will have better use under MAPS than they currently do because these can actually solve these decision points. You can use these real-world databases to establish these points of expanding the population in MAPS. That's the theory, and that's what we think is going to happen. So, conclusions. Real-world evidence from GP, hospital, and patient-led databases has the potential to really reduce the time needed to bring stuff to market, and to patients, more importantly. Patient databases, such as uh, Patients Know Best, can really support this, being much more engaged and actually work directly with the development at much more efficiently, you know, reductions, not 4,000 know, 4, instead of 4 million in our study. The strategy of database development should start looking at combining these because in some indications, yes, obviously you want the exotic tertiary numbers, but you also need the GP data. And really, the data sharing legislation, at least in Europe, could potentially put a lot of this at risk. So we hope that sense prevails and that more evidence like this is presented to the public so that people understand the potential impact of what these databases can do to bring better, faster cures to patients who need them. So with that, I'll take your questions. Thank you.